Hello, fellow teachers. Welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox. My goal is to help you to either teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. And this week, we're going to be taking a look at the books of First and Second Thessalonians. So if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. First, some background on these books. First Thessalonians is believed to be Paul's first epistle and his earliest writing. It's possibly the oldest writing in the entire New Testament, either, maybe even written before the Gospels. And Second Thessalonians appears to have been written not long after. Now, Thessalonica was the largest and most prosperous city in Macedonia. And after establishing the church there, Paul was forced out of the city by the Jewish leaders. And then Paul sends back Timothy, his missionary companion, to Thessalonica to check on the state of those converts' faith. And in response, he heard that they were doing well and that their faith was strong. So these epistles, kind of like Philippians, aren't very corrective in tone, but are more complementary. And a major theme of both of these books is the second coming of Christ. The Thessalonians apparently had a number of questions on that particular topic. And so Paul is going to help clarify their understanding, and in the process, our understanding of that doctrine. So I'd like to begin our study of this book with a discussion question. Who is a teacher that has had an impact on your life? And how did they impact you? And for me, two people come to mind. One, uh, my high school art history teacher, Miss Hughes. And she taught with such passion and mastery of the subject matter that she instilled in me a love for art and architecture and culture and history that, that has really never left me. I always looked forward to her class and I left a better person because of it. She enriched my life in a meaningful way. And then second, my father is probably the greatest teacher that I've ever known personally. Amongst all the other things that a father teaches a son, I'm perhaps most grateful for how he instilled in me a love for the scriptures and a passion for teaching them. His love for Christ and for the truth have never faltered, and I am forever grateful for his example and his knowledge. Well, we are a church of teachers. Whether we do it as missionaries or as ministers, Sunday school or primary teachers or seminary teachers, as parents, grandparents, siblings, or as speakers in sacrament meeting, we all end up teaching something at some point to someone in this church. And we're probably going to have those kinds of experiences frequently. Therefore, teaching is a skill that we, we've we got to develop as disciples of Christ if we wish to magnify our discipleship. But take it from somebody who's taught much of his life. Teaching can be challenging. It's hard. That's one of the reasons I started these videos. It was to help give teachers and parents in the church who are feeling a bit overwhelmed with the responsibility of teaching the scriptures to their families or to others. And with my experience as a teacher, I felt that perhaps I could, I could help a little bit. Well, Paul has some help for teachers here in the book of First Thessalonians. He was one of the greatest teachers to ever live. And by example, he's going to give us some great suggestions on how to become more effective, more Christ-like teachers of the gospel. And he's going to do that by example. We're going to examine the way that he teaches and treats the Thessalonians in an effort to learn how to be teachers more like him. And in that study, we're also going to learn how to teach more like Christ, because that's who Paul sought to emulate. So the first thing I want you to do is to make a label on the title page of 1 Thessalonians uh, that looks like this. How to be a more Christ-like gospel teacher. And then what I've done is I've gone through and I've pulled out what I feel to be some of the best and most important principles 
from these chapters. And the way I've approached this is to, to create a thinking map or a poster or a glue-in that gives my students the scripture references that these principles are found in and a place to write those suggestions and thoughts down in the provided boxes. And when we're finished, what we're going to have is an excellent visual reference on becoming greater, more Christ-like teachers. So I'd give my students the sheet and some time to study these verses quietly on their own and to fill in as many of the boxes as they can. And I'd also tell them that if there are some verses that they struggle with or that they don't understand, they can't interpret, then don't get too worried about it. Just skip those ones. And then we'll be going over each of them together as a class. And, and that's what I'd like to do with you now. So first, chapter 1, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Christ-like teachers pray for their students. They make mention of them in their prayers and, and thank God for the privilege of teaching them, for being put into a position where, where they can influence and bless them. Now, depending on your class size, you may not be able to pray for each student individually each and every time you pray. But certainly you can pray for them collectively. And even when we do that, I think it would be appropriate and advisable to pray for at least a few individual students by name each day especially those that you know are struggling in some way or, or who you don't seem to be connecting with. This practice can change the way that we see our students and influence the way that we treat and work with them. Personally, I, I do believe that prayer can make a difference in the lives of other people. It's got the power to call down the powers of heaven for the benefit of our fellow man. Prayer can change them and prayer can change us. And if we are parents or grandparents, then we can pray for those individuals that we're teaching individually and perhaps every day. Next, chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. So can you see what Paul's doing there in those verses? He's praising the people. Christ-like teachers praise their students for good works, and they encourage them in those good things. Now, this is just one example of Paul doing this kind of thing, but we've seen him do this all throughout our study of the epistles, even to the people that he's correcting or who have problems that he's trying to solve. You constantly see him emphasizing the positive and, and telling them the good things that they're doing. He praises them often. So let's do the same thing. Let's seek to encourage our students. We can praise them when they put forth effort and strive to always teach with an uplifting and an inviting spirit. Personally, I, I try not to tell my students what they should do. I try to avoid that word when I teach. Rather, it's usually better to tell them what they can do. For example, rather than browbeating them with, you should be doing better, you should be obedient, you should dress modestly, you should pay your tithing. Instead, we could say something more like, hey, you don't have to be like the rest of the world. You can stand out for righteousness. You can be the light of the world. You can set an example to the people around you. You can pay your tithing. You can be modest. Can you see the difference in there? It's small, but it's significant. Chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Christ-like teachers teach with the power of the Holy Ghost. This has got to be one of the most important principles. Teachers must have the Spirit. You've got to be connected to that power and open to the guidance of the Holy Ghost as we teach. It's usually not advisable to try and teach a lesson 
until we have felt the power of the Holy Ghost witness of those truths that we're teaching first. It's got to sink deep into our hearts before we can expect it to sink deep into theirs. And then, and only then, can we teach with real power. And that it, the power isn't really coming from us then. It's the Spirit that's teaching, which is exactly what we want. Chapter 2, verse 2. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Christ-like teachers teach with boldness. That's the key word there. So this is a bit of a balancing principle to some of the others that we've already covered. We should be careful not to hold back from teaching the truth to our students. We don't need to sugarcoat it or avoid tough or sensitive topics. We also shouldn't be afraid of offending students who may not be living what we're teaching. As long as we're teaching the gospel simply, purely, without speculation or exaggeration, then we don't need to be concerned about that. I taught in Arizona for years, and, and I once got a phone call from a mother who wasn't happy that I had taught the principle of modesty. She said that it made her daughter feel uncomfortable. I, I politely explained to that mother that I was always very careful not to call attention to any specific student and that I would never teach my own opinion on the subject or create my own definition of modesty. But what I had taught and what I teach are, are the standards that are clearly set forth by the church in writing. I would only ever quote the For the Strength of Youth pamphlet without embellishment or editorializing. I told her that I would continue to teach that truth to my students, that I didn't feel right avoiding certain topics or principles because they might make somebody feel uncomfortable. I'm sure that I've made a lot of students feel uncomfortable when I've spoken about our standards on pornography or media or language or honesty. What actions and decisions my students make when they leave my classroom are theirs and theirs alone. They've got to make those decisions by themselves. But as a teacher, I'm going to make sure that before they leave, that they know the truth. That's my calling as a teacher, to teach them truth. In the spirit of love and encouragement and understanding. And to love them and respect them and to help them regardless of whether they follow or live those truths or not. But at least they're going to know it. Holding back the truth for fear of offense isn't love at all. Like Paul and like Christ, we've got to be bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel. All right, chapter 2, verse 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. So Christ-like teachers teach with sincerity. We don't want to just go through the motions. If we don't really care about the experience that we're going to create for our students in our lessons, or if we don't really care about them, then they're going to know it. <laughs> People, and especially teenagers, can see right through a fake persona. They can tell when we don't care. So we've got to teach from the heart not in deceit, uncleanness, or guile. And if we find it hard to develop a love for those that we teach, and trust me, I know that some students are harder to love than others, then we've got to pray for it. We've got to pray for that Christ-like, unconditional love. Ask, and ye shall receive. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. 
A Christ-like teacher is not a men-pleaser. They aren't worried about popularity, but they strive to teach how God wants them to teach. And this is more balancing here. Yes, we should love our students, but we also shouldn't be too worried about what they think about us, especially with the youth. We're not seeking to be their best friend. We're not trying to be one of them. I remember the very first year that I taught seminary. I was young, and, and I wasn't too much older than some of my students. And to be honest, I wanted to be liked. That was important to me. And so I was quite permissive in my teaching. I wasn't willing to confront them because I was afraid that, that if I told them no, or, or I was strict with the rules, or if I challenged them to rise to an expectation, that they might not like it. And then they may not like me. And so I tried to be really buddy-buddy with them and to talk like them and to act like them. Well, you know what? That, that worked well for a couple of months. But then they started to take advantage of that fact. Uh, they began to walk all over me. And then to try and maintain some semblance of control in the classroom, I had to start getting after them. And the effect that this had was by the end of the year, they neither respected nor liked me. And so, so I suggest that rather than worrying about our students liking us, we place our emphasis on creating a certain type of environment in our classroom, one of respect, love, and vision, that we want them to experience something special and unique while they're with us, that they are going to gain a deeper understanding of the gospel, the scriptures, and of Jesus Christ. I have no problem with setting high expectations for my students, creating rules and following through on those rules without anger, without lecture, without frustration. Just You just got to go in with this mindset of today I am going to create an environment or an atmosphere that that is going to give every individual in my class a chance to feel the spirit and to learn. My job is to create that atmosphere and defend it with my life. If there are individuals that are making that difficult or impossible, then my job or calling is to face that issue head on, to open up a can of worms if need be. If we approach our teaching with that attitude, that approach, then I believe and I've learned that our students will not only respect us, but they will begin to like us as well. We'll get the best of both worlds. Chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. I love the back and forth here from Paul. He's always carefully balancing his approach. Christ-like teachers are not men-pleasers, and they're not worried about getting glory, but they are gentle. They are affectionately desirous of those they teach, because their students are dear unto them. They treat and cherish their students as if they were their own children. And you know what? I've actually had the opportunity to teach two of my own children as their seminary teacher. And when I first had that opportunity, when I first did that, I found myself wanting to be better as a teacher and to be more prepared than ever before because I was now teaching one of my own children as well. And, and when I, I noticed that I was doing this, I thought to myself, well, that's kind of lame. Why should I be doing anything different than I've been doing in past years? Why should I be trying harder for my own children? Every single one of my students is somebody else's son or daughter. And they're hoping and they're praying that their children are going to have the best possible experience with the gospel and with the scriptures. So I resolved then that I was going to treat all of my students and every year of teaching as if I were preparing to teach my own children and to cherish each and every student in the same way I would cherish 
my own children. Seeing your students in that way can change the way you approach teaching. them. Chapter 2, verse 9. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Christ-like teachers work hard. They work hard to teach well. We don't want to be one of those teachers that finally cracks open the scriptures or the manual on the very day that we're supposed to teach or, or during sacrament meeting, the hour before. Christ-like teachers put in the time they need to prepare themselves mentally and spiritually. Now, we've got to have balance and not overdo it. My personal standard is that I spend at least two hours preparing a lesson before I teach it. I find it very difficult to do the minimum work required to teach a quality lesson with anything less. And that's just me. On the other hand, I, I don't think we need to be spending six to eight hours uh, on a lesson either. I found that when I put too much time into preparation, I usually find myself getting frustrated because I don't have enough time to teach what I've prepared. I've prepared too much. As teachers, we got to try to seek a healthy balance in, in our preparation efforts. But certainly, the people that we teach deserve our very best. So, so let's put in the work that's necessary to be effective and prepared teachers. Chapter 2, verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Christ-like teachers are not hypocrites. They seek to be righteous themselves. And that doesn't mean that we have to be living a certain principle or commandment perfectly in order to teach it to another person. But we should, at the very least, have a commitment to and a belief in what we're teaching. We don't want to teach a gospel principle to others that we don't feel, that, that we don't feel that it's a divine principle ourselves. Still, I believe that we can teach the principle of controlling our anger when we may still struggle with that a little bit. We can still encourage other people to do missionary work even when we don't feel that we are the greatest of missionaries. The best teachers are those that are going to teach by example. Jesus lived everything that he taught, and he never taught anything that he wasn't willing to live or do himself. And he, he exemplified that. Chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Christ-like teachers exhort, charge, and invite their students to walk worthy of God. I don't think that we should ever end any gospel lesson without issuing some kind of an invitation or a challenge. Gospel teaching is not just about dispensing information. It's about edifying and enriching lives. We're not just trying to fill the time or survive the class. But we're seeking to give them an opportunity to change, to inspire them to love and live the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I was going through the training process of becoming a seminary teacher, there was a specific phrase that they, they drummed into our heads. Never go in to teach until you are confident and excited. And that stayed with me. That's how I know that I'm prepared or that I have prepared enough to go and teach. I'm confident and excited. Chapter 2, verses 19 through 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Christ-like teachers find joy in their students' righteousness. Nothing makes me happier than when I see one of my former students living the gospel. I love getting mission announcements and wedding invitations and pictures on social media of former students growing happy families in the gospel. Sometimes I might run into a former student in the temple or with their spouses and children 
that always brings a smile to my face. That's the joy of a teacher, to see that the gospel has had an impact on our students' lives. Chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. And sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you, and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. You know, a little background on this one first. The saints in Thessalonica had been sorely persecuted for joining the church. Paul wanted to make sure that they were doing okay in their afflictions. And so he sent Timothy to help and strengthen them. So what do Christ-like teachers do? They seek to help their students in their afflictions and their trials. We want to be there for our students, to let them know that we care and that we're willing to help them in any way that we can. And a very exciting development in church education in the last couple of years has been an increased focus on teaching youth how to work through and deal with their doubts and questions about the church and the gospel. There's a whole program called Doctrinal Mastery that's focused on that. Rather than just telling them what you feel the solution or answer to their question is, we show them, teach them how to navigate these questions and doubts on their own and how to find the answers themselves. It's apparent that Paul had taught the saints in Thessalonica in such a way that they were able to maintain their faith even though he wasn't there to help them at that time. And that's our goal as teachers, to teach them how to study the scriptures or live the gospel or face their doubts and questions on their own. To teach them to fish rather than just giving them a fish, so to speak. To teach them in such a way that we become irrelevant, right? That they become self-sufficient in the gospel. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face, and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. And this is a great concluding set of verses that reiterates some of the principles that we've already talked about. Teachers find joy in their students' faith. They pray for them night and day. And here, Christ-like teachers seek to increase their students' faith where it is lacking. And that will round out our chart here. There we have it. 13 powerful principles to becoming more Christ-like teachers of the gospel. To truly teach in the Savior's way which is the name of the new manual that they have for, for teachers in the church. Let's try to teach like the Savior. To liken the scriptures, after reflecting on those verses, what's your plan for becoming a more Christ-like teacher? Which of these do you most need to work on? I invite you to choose at least one to focus on over the next couple of weeks. And then once you feel you've increased or improved in that thing, Come back to this chart and, and try on another. I'd encourage you to take that little piece of paper. You could stick it right in your scriptures or put it somewhere where you will see it. Then our efforts to become more like Christ will be visible and easier to follow through on. Teaching is one of the most important callings that we're ever going to have in this life. And I'm not just talking about former callings in the church that are teaching based. We're all called to be teachers as disciples of Christ. And I know that it can seem overwhelming at times, and there are going to be times when we feel inadequate. We're all going to have lessons that we feel didn't go very well. But remember, if you struggle as a teacher, you're not a failure. It's normal. Like any other skill, teaching requires practice, trial and error, and time. And that's okay. We're all going to have students, too, that, that don't seem to respond to our message. That doesn't mean we're failures. Take Jesus, for example. How many people rejected him? And he was the greatest teacher to ever live. And then don't forget that God has provided us with a lot of help. The Holy Ghost can help us. 
God can help us, and we can turn to loving leaders and spouses and friends for support. Remember that God is the one that's called you. And like President Monson used to say, whom God calls, God qualifies. Or like you always hear me say every week, let's get out there and teach with power. All right, we're, we're not done yet. <laughs> now, I wish I could do this next icebreaker with you for real, because I found it to be really fun and effective. However, a big caution here. I've presented this idea before on this channel, and I got some pushback from some people in the comments who felt that this was not a good idea or that it was even a betrayal of trust between teacher and student. Now, now I do see this a little bit differently. And so, so all I can say is know your students, okay? Know your teaching style and consider the kind of relationship that you have with your classes. I admit that this may not be the best idea for all students or situations. Although, personally, I've never had any, any big issues with it or complaints about it from students. Just proceed with caution. And, you know, I'll also provide you with an alternative icebreaker activity if you feel like this isn't going to work for you. But what I do is I have a relaxation exercise with my class. And I tell them to put their heads down and to relax. I turn out the lights and I put on some soft music and tell them to breathe deeply. And I would let that go on for at least a minute or two. And then when everyone was good and relaxed, maybe even some might start to fall asleep. I slowly pull out a horn, okay? One of those plastic air horns that you might see at soccer games. Uh, some people call them vuvuzelas. And I used to do this with an actual air horn, but I do believe that that is a bit much. It's a little too loud, a little too startling, but the Vuvuzela isn't quite so jarring. And so I'll put a link in the video description below if you're interested, uh, uh, where you could purchase one on Amazon. They're, they're fairly inexpensive, but when you blow that horn, they're going to be startled and surprised and wake up. And then once they've settled down a bit, I like to ask this question. What event in the plan of salvation is going to be kind of like that for a lot of people? And you can turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 7 for a hint. And what do those verses say? But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. So what's the event? It's the second coming. That's the day of the Lord that Paul's talking about in verse 2. And how is the second coming kind of like the experience we just had? Well, you, as the teacher, were kind of playing the role of Satan there. Satan wants to put us to sleep, spiritually. He wants us to be relaxed and unconcerned about some future judgment or some future event. I mean, the best time to pull a prank on somebody is when they're asleep. Do you remember when you did this at scout camp or, or girls camp? That's when you play pranks on people, right? Reminds me of this verse in 2 Nephi 28, verse 21, where Nephi says, speaking of Satan, and others will he pacify and lull them away into carnal security, that they will say, all is well in Zion. Yea, Zion prospereth, all is well. And thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. 
couple of words that stand out to me in that passage? Pacify, lull, and carefully. To get a, a baby to go to sleep at night, you might give them a pacifier or sing them a lull, a bye. And you'll be very careful not to startle or to wake them up. That's what Satan's trying to do with all of us. He's trying to put us to sleep so that we won't be prepared or ready when the Savior returns. Now quickly for the alternate icebreaker activity, if you don't feel like the, the horn is a good idea, you could just have a little discussion about the funniest prank that they've ever pulled on someone at a youth camp or a family camping activity or, or to a family member when they were asleep. You have any experiences with that? I mean, you know the old classic where you put shaving cream or whipped cream on their hand and then tickle their nose and see what happens. I've, I've had that one done to me. Or the, the shake the tent in the middle of the night and growl like a bear. Or maybe someone has honked the horn or screamed while you were sleeping in the car. You know, the, the old standbys. You could probably just have a fun little discussion of some experience with sleeping pranks. Or you know, on YouTube, there's, there's funny videos of people pulling pranks on people that are sleeping. You might consider that to be a better way to begin this portion of the lesson, depending on your style and your class. But back to the lesson. Paul uses two different metaphors in those verses that we just read. Did you see them? What is the second coming going to be like for some? One, like a thief in the night. A thief in the night sneaks up on you without you knowing it. They come when you're vulnerable, in your sleep. Uh, uh, personally, just a couple of weeks ago, I had my mountain bike stolen right out of my garage. Right, uh, uh, Something had gotten in the way and didn't realize that the, the garage door had not fully closed. So somebody got in and stole my bike. When did they do it? When did they feel comfortable enough to do that? In the night when I was asleep. So that can kind of be like the second coming. For many, it's going to come out of nowhere. Like waking up in the morning and they realize it's happened like the horn. And then the second metaphor is that it comes like a, a woman in labor. That's what travail means. A woman does not know exactly when the child is going to come. At some point, the labor pains are going to hit and that baby is on its way and you can't do anything to stop it. Well, that's like the second coming as well. But Paul tells the saints that their experience with the second coming is going to be different if they heed his counsel. It won't be like that to them. They are not in darkness. They're not going to be surprised. They may not know the exact moment when the thief is coming, or when the labor pains are going to begin, or when the horn is going to sound, but there's a key difference for them. They're not asleep. They're watching. They're ready. They're sober. They're prepared. They know that the thief is coming. And so they're awake and they're waiting and they're prepared to face him. If I'd have known that my bike was going to be stolen out of the garage, I, I could sit out there and wait. And when that person showed up, I'd shout or startle them and they would run away. I would have been ready and my bike would not have been stolen. Uh, with the, the, the woman in travail metaphor, they know the baby's coming. So they've got the bags packed, the doctor informed everything in place for the moment when it starts. And then with the horn example, do you think that you would have been startled by the noise if you had had your heads up, your eyes open, and you were staring at me awake and you saw me pull the horn out and lift it to my lips and take a deep breath? No, I don't think you would have been startled. You may not have known the exact moment when I was going to blow the horn, but you'd have been ready for it you wouldn't have been surprised when the sound finally came. Well, that's how our Heavenly Father wants us to be. And he gives those kinds of people a name. What are they, according to these verses? The children of light, or the children of the day. That's who we want to be. We want to be fully awake, 
fully aware for that day of days. And that for me is the theme for the rest of First and Second Thessalonians. How can we be the children of light? What actions and attitudes are going to help us to be prepared for the second coming? And so I put a label at the top of the page that looks like this. How to be a child of light or how to be prepared for the second coming. And then Paul's got a lot of great advice for us. And here, rather than just giving them a giant list, you could play a little game with them. I divide my class into two teams or more, depending on the size of the class. And that could be boys versus girls or some other arrangement. But I give them the first letter of every word in a sentence and then challenge them to be the first team to have a person discover the phrase that it represents. Whichever team finds it first gets a point. By the end of the game, the team with the most points earned wins. Or a fun additional thing that you could do is to give them a chance to roll uh, the big dice. I have a large foam, uh, a 20-sided dice that I use for this activity. And uh, once a team gets the correct answer, they earn a chance to roll the big dice. And then we just add up the numbers as we play, and the team with the highest score at the end wins. And that, that can be kind of fun. Uh, and I'll put a link in the description below to Amazon where, where you could purchase one of these if you're interested. And one of the great aspects of doing the game that way is if you have one team that seems to answer a lot of the questions more often, it doesn't discourage the other teams because, hey, uh, they might roll the dice five times and, and earn low numbers. And all it would take would be one roll of the dice of the other team to, to catch up. So it keeps things kind of even. So here are the clues. And I don't go in order because uh, I want it to be a little bit challenging. But I do at least give them the chapter and, and, and a set of verses where the answers are going to be found. One other thing. Your students should play this game with a marking pencil in hand. Because once the phrases are found, you're going to encourage everybody to mark that phrase. That way, this is more than just a game or, or, or a way to pass the time. It's a marking activity. And in the end... Everybody's going to have these key ideas marked in their scriptures on how to become children of light. So the answers to all of the following clues are found in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 12. So uh, here on the podcast, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the letters, but you can see them up on the screen there. So the answer to this one, chapter 4, verse 6 that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. So to be a children of light, a child of light, be honest with your fellow man. Next one, chapter 4, verse 9. Love one another. That's what Jesus told us was the true mark of a disciple. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that ye have love one to another. Next, chapter 4, verse 11. Work with your own hands. Stay busy. Be anxiously engaged in a good cause. Next, chapter 4, verse 3. Abstain from fornication. So be sexually pure. Next, chapter 4, verse 10. Increase more and more. We should always be striving to be better. Like we talked about last week in the book of Philippians. And a harder one here, just two letters. Chapter 4, verse 1. Please God. Don't please the world. Seek to please your heavenly Father. And then for a second round, you can move to chapter 5, looking in verses 8 through 28. So this first one, chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Don't even get close to evil. Don't even give anybody the excuse to think that you're doing evil. My favorite example of this principle is former apostle Elder L. Tom Perry, who at high-class business meetings would always order a glass of milk to drink so that it was absolutely obvious that he wasn't drinking alcohol. 
Yeah, he said that he could have ordered a soda or some other kind of drink that, that didn't stand out so much. But then he was worried that somebody might think that he was drinking alcohol. So he ordered milk. And he said that even though it was kind of embarrassing at first, others started joining him for a glass of milk instead of alcohol. And it even brought him more business opportunities. If we go out of our way to avoid even the appearance of evil, then we distance ourselves that much further from temptation. Next, chapter 5, verse 11. Edify one another. Build each other up. Teach each other. Help each other. Next, 517. Pray without ceasing. Next, verse 13. Be at peace among yourselves. Verse 21. Hold fast that which is good. Next, 19. Quench not the Spirit. Be sure not to ignore the promptings of the Holy Ghost. And then also, don't listen to music or watch movies or read books or anything that causes the Spirit to leave, that quenches it. Next, verse 16. Rejoice evermore, so be happy. Next, verse 14. Be patient toward all men. Next, 18. In everything, give thanks. Verse 14. Support the weak. Verse 20. Despise not prophesyings. And then verse 15. Ever follow that which is good. And there you go. You know, who won the game? And now you can look back over your scriptures and see all the things that you can do to become a child of light, a disciple that is fully awake. And if we are the children of light, then the second coming isn't going to startle us. That great and terrible day won't come as a thief in the night. We'll be prepared and ready for it. It will be a great day for us, not a terrible one. Now for 2 Thessalonians, a very short book, which also deals with the theme of being prepared for the second coming. Maybe just a few quick ideas. Some background first. Some of the members in Thessalonica were being taught by others, by, by false teachers, that the second coming had already happened, that Jesus had already returned and that they had missed it. Some of these false teachers apparently had gone so far as to create fake letters supposedly from the apostles, teaching those false doctrines. Well, Paul puts that idea to rest with probably the most famous or well-known verses in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, we know exactly what he's referring to here. What is this falling away of which Paul speaks? That falling away is what we know as the great apostasy. The second coming was not imminent in Paul's day. The apostasy was going to come first. And it has. Which is the reason for why we needed Joseph Smith and the restoration. If you're ever trying to explain to somebody the necessity of the restoration with biblical precedent, then these are some great verses to, to know and to be ready to share. And if you as a teacher wish to focus more on the doctrinal aspect of those verses, there's a great little video that you could show that goes into depth in explaining the concepts or the principles of gospel dispensations, apostasy, and restoration. So I'll put a link to that video in the video description below. 
But I also like to focus on a different aspect of 2 Thessalonians. Keep in mind that this book is directed to a people that are being deceived. So for an icebreaker, I like to tell a little story from a talk that I once heard, uh, given by Elder David E. Sorensen. That's that stuck with me over the years. It goes like this. There was a man who worked for the United States Treasury Department. His job was investigating cases where counterfeit money was involved. He was so good at what he did that all it took was a quick look at a bill, and he could tell if it was genuine or counterfeit. One evening at a press conference, following his breaking up of a major counterfeit ring, one of the reporters directed this statement to him. You must spend a lot of time studying counterfeit bills to recognize them so easily. His reply to this was, No, I don't ever study counterfeit bills. I spend my time studying genuine bills. Then the imperfection is easy to recognize. I think that there's a clue in that story on how not to be deceived. What do you think it is? I answer, know the real thing. Don't spend your time studying lies, but get to know the truth so well. Spend so much time studying it and listening to it and knowing it that anything deviating from it is going to become easily identifiable. Well, 2 Thessalonians works along that same theme. It has a lot of counterfeiting words in it or words that suggest the idea of deceit. Let's see if you can find some of these. I'll give you the verses and you look for any word or phrase that suggests trickery or deception. With my seminary students, I might throw out a small treat to those who can find the word or phrase first. So here's a list of those references. And what are the words? From chapter 2, verse 2, shaken in mind, troubled. Chapter 2, verse 3, deceive you. Chapter 2, verse 7, mystery of iniquity. Chapter 2, verse 9, signs and lying wonders. Verse 10, deceivableness of unrighteousness. And then verse 11, strong delusion or believe a lie. Okay, so, so that's the problem being presented in 2 Thessalonians. They're being deceived. But then, as you always hear me say, the scriptures never present a problem without a solution being nearby. Because we live in a day where we are also susceptible to deception. There are a lot of false messages going around out there. And so our question becomes, how can we protect ourselves from being deceived? I see at least five suggestions in 2 Thessalonians. Now, you could just simply put these references up on the board and have your students search uh, for those counsels, those suggestions. Or, alternatively, you could use this letter tile handout activity. And what you do is you read the suggested verses and then unscramble the letter tiles to reveal the message from that verse. So I'll go over the answers with you here. Chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So suggestion number one, love the truth. How do you know if you love the truth? Well, how do you know if you love another person? You spend time with them. You sacrifice for them. You learn about them. You enjoy being with them. Well, do we do the same kinds of things with the truth? Reminds me of the man in the story. How did he recognize the counterfeit bills? He studied the real ones. He spent a lot of time with the real ones. We've got to do the same thing with truth. We need to love the truth, fill our lives with truth and goodness. And then we're going to easily recognize the lies and the evil. So study the scriptures, listen to the general authorities, attend your church meetings, and then on top of that, spend time watching good movies, reading good books, listening to good music, and learning about good things. And then when the evil things come along, 
will know the difference. Chapter 2, verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. Suggestion number two, hold the traditions is the answer. We need to stand fast and hold the traditions of what we've been taught. There's a lot of criticism these days of the ways of the past. To be old-fashioned, traditional, conservative, conventional, is not usually considered a good thing in our world. It's much more desirable to be progressive, forward-thinking, modern. Fortunately, new things and ideas have not often stood the test of time. Often they're passing fads. They're fleeting. They're unproven. Now, not that all has been rosy and perfect in the past. I'm not saying that progress is a bad thing. But if we cut ourselves off from the past, we're much more likely to be deceived. I think that's why we're commanded to study the scriptures. These are, are books that are very old. They're filled with traditions and principles and truths that are eternal and unchanging. What was true for Moses is true for Paul, it's true for Joseph Smith, and it's true for us too. So we've got to hold fast, stand fast in those things. Okay, two verses in this next one. Chapter 3, verse 4 and verse 7. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And 7. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Suggestion number three, follow the prophets. You might notice that in our day, most prophets are men of age. They have experience and foresight. They're not going to be easily deceived because they've already seen a thing or two. Therefore, we can trust their vision. And if we do that, we won't be deceived either. Chapter three, verse six. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Suggestion number four, withdraw from the disorderly. Withdraw yourselves from every brother that, that walks disorderly, uh, those that seek to draw us away. However, chapter 3, verse 15 adds, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So be careful who you spend your time with. Be careful who you allow to influence you. Withdraw from those that you feel are trying to deceive you or that you feel are drawing you down a wrong path. But I, I do like that Paul tells us not to count him as an enemy though, uh, but just to admonish them. If somebody is truly having a negative impact on your life though, spiritually, there is a time to withdraw from that kind of influence. And then lastly, verse 13, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Suggestion number five, stay busy. Be not weary in well-doing. Be anxiously engaged in a good cause. We've heard Paul say that a number of times. Do good things. Idle hands are the devil's workshop, as they say. Work hard, find righteous causes to champion, and live for something more than just passive entertainment. So now, to liken the scriptures, how has one of these suggestions helped you in the past? And which one do you most need to implement in your future? Well, I promise you that, that if we do these kinds of things, we're not going to be deceived. We will be able to see through the counterfeits, the deceivableness of unrighteousness, the lies and the strong delusions. We are going to see things as they really are. And that's going to conclude our lesson for this week. I hope that it helped you. And, and if it did help you in some way, I encourage you to share it with somebody else. I'm so grateful for all of you out there, uh, my listeners and my watchers, who uh, spend this time in the scriptures with me every week. You are the reason I do this channel. So thank you for joining me 
this week. Now get out there and teach with power.